Hello fellow modelers, in today's video I'll be showing you how I built, painted and weathered the Ryefield models 1 to 35th scale Challenger 2 TES. I'll also be including a section showing how I converted this model to remote control. I like my models weathered on the heavier side, so what I'll be making is completely my take on what a real weathered Challenger 2 would look like. If you do happen to find any inaccuracies or places where I can improve, please leave your comment down below. I read every single comment. What you're seeing now is a quick unboxing. The included parts are already highly detailed and the instructions are mostly easy to follow. And here is where we begin the long build process. It's a constant cycle of cutting parts off the spruce, cleaning them up, and gluing them onto the model. As this model will be remote controlled, I'll be installing a Tamiya twin motor gearbox first, before I glue the whole together. I purchased the gearbox online for around $5.
And this is what the finished Tamiya gearbox looks like. The kit also comes with a tube of lubricant, but the usage of it is really optional. For the next step, we'll need to cut off the mounts on the gearbox to save space. The original axles for the drive sprocket should also be cut off and the holes need to be drilled through. After that, you can glue everything together and your model's engine is now installed. We need to shorten the shaft to the length of the original shaft. With the gearbox in place, I can now glue together the lower hull. After that, glue the plastic sprocket that came with the kit onto the metal shaft. To get the suspension to work properly, you first need to cut off the stopper piece on the torsion bar. I hollowed out the inside of the wheel using a modeling knife to make the wheel spin more freely later on.
I've gone ahead and finished the assembly of most of the model, keeping all moving parts moving and everything in large chunks for ease of painting. Now for some electronics. We'll need an RC receiver board and transmitter, a single motor with a reduced spin rate, and a battery for now. I purchased all mine online for around $7. Here you can see that we'll need an adapter to connect our battery and our receiver board. To connect all the components together, we'll need to do some soldering. For this, we'll need a soldering iron, some solder, and enough heat shrinking tubes. You can use electrical tape to replace the heat shrinking tubes if you don't have them. I'm no soldering master, so I'll leave the soldering lessons to the professionals. Here, you can see that I'll be leaving the gun elevation as it is because my remote control set only has 6 channels, meaning I can only have 3 motors that move backwards and forwards. 4 channels are already reserved for the transmission, that leaves 2 left for the turret rotation. Speaking of which, you can see here that I cut up the teeth of a couple gears and stuck them onto the turret ring. This method won't be as effective as you will see later on, but I'm sure you can make it work by fixing the motor to the tank so it doesn't wobble as much as mine. Time for painting. This here is my painting break. I've got my larger chunks on my left, with a painting booth in the center. On my right, I've taped the smaller pieces like the road wheels to the box of the model using masking tape. This way, they won't be flying around when I paint them. Let's start painting the lower hull. The first coat of paint we'll be applying is white primer. For this, we should prepare an airbrush connected to a pump, and of course, the white primer. I'm using MIG's acrylic white primer.
After priming the model, we'll need to do what's called pre-shading. I'll be doing this with MIGS Matte Black and Acrylic Thinner. And this is the result of my pre-shading. As you can see, I used black to outline the details and white to highlight the center of each panel. Now for the main external color. I'll be painting my tank in NATO Green from MIG while using their acrylic thinner. I recommend painting only two thin layers so you can still see the paint underneath. To add some variation to this monochromatic paint scheme, I'll be using some of MIG's US Modern Vehicles paint in certain areas. And here is the result. As you can see, there's a little overspray here and there. To fix this, we'll be painting on the color we want to fix it using the precision of a brush. I'll be using a small bowl, two fine paintbrushes, and MIG's acrylic NATO green. In the next step, we'll be creating discoloration of the paint by speckling on the paint we were just using, but diluting it slightly. Now, we'll be painting the larger details including the rubber mud guards. I'll be using matte black and acrylic thinner. Remember, when painting these details, we always want to paint in thin layers and build up the color layer by layer. This way, we can reduce the visibility of each brush stroke.
here, you can see me using the same black paint to paint the rubber on the road wheels. Other details including the tow cable are painted using the same color. Another detail we'll be painting now are the lights. The tail lights can be painted directly on the sprue, but the headlights require more attention. Paints for the tail light include red and orange. As for the headlight, I'll be painting the back of the light in steel color. I then glued the clear pieces onto the model using Elmer's all-purpose glue. You can use any other glue that dries clear yet doesn't damage the plastic, like PVA glue. Time for decal application. I have prepared a bit of tap water that I'll be soaking the decals in after I cut them apart individually. I'll soak them in water until I can see that the decals are starting to lift off from the paper underneath. To stick the decals onto the model, I'll be using MIG's decal set and decal fix solutions. After moving the decal to the position you want it, apply another layer of decal set and wait 15 minutes for it to dry. You can then apply the decal fix solution in intervals of 15 minutes for a few times until the decal is fixed to the location and sits flush on the surface. Now, I'm adding highlights to the details on the model using NATO green and matte white. I'm creating a color lighter than the base paint of the tank, and will be painting this color onto the raised details using a paintbrush. This will allow details to further pop out.
Finally, it's time for weathering. For my attempt at distressing the paint, I'll be using light green and yellow oil paints. This process is straightforward. All you have to do is apply the paint directly onto the model in tiny random dots. After that, just blend everything together using enamel thinner. The result is a green with lots of variation. The next step would be chipping. I'm diluting chipping paint with acrylic thinner and mixing the paint with a toothbrush. This task will require a very fine brush for painting the fine chips. I'm painting the chipping paint in areas I believe would have lots of traffic. I make dots for small chips and lines for scratches. Try to keep this effect random. If you want your tank to be cleaner, you don't even need to paint chips as modern tanks like the Challenger 2 TES and the Leopard 2 A7 don't really chip. Their paint is pretty advanced and stays on quite well, I'd assume. <laughs> Thank you. 
If you find this process too time consuming, you can use a sponge to apply the chips. We only need a tiny amount of paint on the sponge, so soak any excess paint off on a tissue. After chipping, we'll need to apply a quick dust wash. I'll be using yellow and white oil paints heavily diluted in enamel thinner. This effect will be applied towards the lower areas of the models and in tight corners where dust would accumulate. As you can see here, besides painting the wash on, I'm also splattering it on to create random splashes. The same treatment was done to the wheels and tracks. Here, I'm creating another wash, but this time it's a darker mud wash. This adds a bit more variation to the previous layer.
for mud with volume, we'll need a cheap brush and a small spatula. I carved my spatula from a toothpick. We'll also need plaster powder and MIGS acrylic mud for dioramas. I'm not using MIGS mud on its own, as I find the particles in it to be too large for this scale. After mixing the paste together, you'll need to work fast as the plaster dries rather quickly. I'm also applying this paste in the lower areas of the tank, where mud and dust would accumulate. water can be used to blend in the mud. The oil paints black, brown, and yellow have been mixed to create a wash with the color of wet mud. This wash will be applied to places randomly, for example, in areas under the ERA. It is now time for the final touches, one of which is using pigments like this gunmetal pigment to highlight details. Here I'm using a rubber tip brush to apply the pigment onto the machine gun. And for some nice antennas, I simply stretched a piece of the kit's sprue, cut them to size, and stuck them onto the model using super glue before painting them in matte black. So these are all the steps I used to build my 1 to 35th scale Challenger 2 TES. The kit was a wonderful experience to build and I would highly recommend it to everyone, even modelers with little experience. If you found this video to be helpful in any way and enjoyed watching, please consider giving it a like and subscribing to my channel. If you have anything to say, please leave your comment in the section down below. I'm really thankful for everyone who has supported me and has given me advice on how to improve. Anyway, thank you for watching and here is the completed model.